Our scripture lesson today may seem familiar to you. It's the same one we had last week as we try to get this in us so that we can be all in um, in our life for God. So let's share in God's good word together. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Right now is your chance to live the life you've always wanted. Not a half-life or a so-so life, but a life worth living. A life that is all in for what you want most. Many years ago, Arthur Brooks met a woman who had the kind of experience you would only expect to find in fiction. As a young adult, she was in a serious car accident resulting in a head injury. She suffered total amnesia, followed by months of healing. And when she recovered, she was never the same. Oddly, her family relationships, instead of getting stronger, they weakened. She cut out former friends and found new ones. She moved halfway across the world. She became more outgoing and less self-conscious. She no longer cared as much about what other people thought. Her parents attributed all these major changes to her, what they called, her bump on the head. But Arthur Brooks writes, But she told me no, that wasn't the case. The injury had nothing to do with it. Rather, it was the recovery time away from ordinary routines that created a punctuation mark in the long sentence of her life. She had a unique opportunity to assess her priorities and she vowed to take nothing in her former life as a given. She said she became happy for the first time in her life. Having come to the edge of death, she decided to live life all in. And friends, today is your day to come clean with yourself and decide to go all in with the wonderful life God has had for you all along. Say yes to God today as we go all in together and trust God to show us what to keep, what to drop, and how to be present for the most important things in life. So we continue on now in our sermon series, All In. We're at week two of our series. And as a way of introduction, I want to remind us, I love the graphic. It's very exciting as we go all in, uh, but never at the casino table. The United Methodist Church takes a strong stance against gambling. Uh, and our uh, book of resolution says this, gambling is a menace to society, deadly to the best interest of moral, social, economic, and spiritual life, and destructive of good government. Gambling feeds on human greed and invites persons to place their trust in possessions rather than in God. It represents a form of idolatry that contradicts the first commandment. Jesus said, love God and love neighbor and have no other gods before me. And it's, it's hard to imagine how um, winning someone else's money, your neighbor's money, um, is loving your neighbor. So, uh, let's set that aside now. So we're not, it's not a sermon series about gambling, but it is a sermon series about risk and faith and trust that God has something better for us. So last week in week one, we said we're going to participate in worship. We're going to be all in in worship. We participate in worship, but we are the church. And, and sometimes people get those two things confused, right? We participate in worship, and we pray and we sing and we receive scripture and, and we take Holy Communion. So that's something we do. We participate in worship, but we are the church. You and I are the church, the body of Christ. And each person is important and has a unique gift to share with the community. Your importance is what you can contribute, how you're beautifully and wonderfully made. There are things that God has made you to do that only you can do. And so I hope we never forget this. Every single person in the church is important and each of us have a unique gift to share with the community. Paul writes about this in the early church, uh, to the church in Rome. He says this, We have gifts that differ. Yep, we're not all the same. Gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry and ministering, the teacher in teaching, exhorter and exhortation, uh, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. I've never known anyone to have all of these, but I have known um, everyone to have some of these. Um, that are active in the church. And so we go back to our scripture uh, that we're found, um, founding this series on. First, Second Timothy says this, For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, no, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Uh, emphasis on the self. Because self-discipline is doing the right thing at the right time for the right reason. Right? It's not other discipline. We don't have that. We're not telling other people to get in line. We're hoping that our self-discipline makes us more like Jesus, doing the right thing at the right time for the right reasons, as Jesus always did. 
And so in 2 Timothy, the next verse says this, Don't be ashamed then of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. This is Paul writing. But join with me in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God. Paul is always quick to say, this isn't in our own flesh. It's not in our own power. It's all about the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So how do we live this out? As United Methodists, we are all in with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. Every professing member of our church has said these words, that this is what it means to be a member at Acts 2 United Methodist Church. And so the first thing we looked at was prayer. And what we decided together as a church is that we would pray together this week five times a day at waking, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and before our head hits the pillow. And specifically this last week, we're praying for our children because we are all in for kids around here. So that was last week. This week, we go all in to show up for one another with our presence, right? It's prayers, presence. So today we're on presence and it's so important. And we want to say thank you. Last week we talked about the needs of our children's department uh, and our children's day out, uh, our upcoming daycare, our children and our youth. And so we want to say thank you and celebrate those who show up for our children and youth. And so we were, we were calling people to help and man, have we got the helpers. It's, it's been so wonderful. We always have room for you. Um, and so I hope you'll continue to pray uh, for our children and youth ministry. Um, but I want to say, look at all these folks. Well, many of you all may be able to actually find your name on there. Um, Stephanie, Karen, Kathy, James, Nick, Alvin, Laura, John, JC, Amber, Bill, Abra, Joetta, Debbie, Don, Heather, Courtney, Jenny, Sarah, Heather, Kelly, Aaron, Callie, Jenny, JC, April, Desiree, Jessica, Elizabeth, Trey, Mike, Aaron, Gretchen, Jacob, Ellie, Emily, Valerie, Amanda, Janine, Angel, Becky, Zoe, and Debbie Kirkendall. Now, this is a great list, but I got to tell you, fellas, we're not very well represented yet. So we got some work to do. We're going to catch up. And so I hope you'll let um, the folks that work with our children and youth know that you all are all in for our kids as well. So here's the thing I want to talk about presence. You know, maybe you're like me and you work really hard at your job and when you come home, you're just wiped out. You're, you're just done. But we need to be able to be present for our families. We need to be present for our church. We need to be present for our community. We need to be present with God. And sometimes when we get home, we think that that's being present. But just because you're home doesn't mean you're present. Will you say that with me? Just because you're home doesn't mean you're present. You can be a million miles away on your phone sitting right next to the people that we say we love most. And this is so important, friends, because the first act of love, it's our attention. It's our attention. That's the beautiful thing about heaven, uh, that everybody's welcome there. There's no rejection there. And we always have God's attention. He is looking at us lovingly. He loves us and is watching us and, and just adores his children. And so the first act of love is attention. How do we do this? How do we live it out? Well, here at Acts 2, our core verse is Acts 2.42. And it says this, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, um, right, scripture, and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And as Methodists, we often will think of fellowship like fellowship dinners, like a potluck. Well, that's part of it. But really, what we're talking about is fellow, right? Fellow to fellow, person to person, uh, togetherness, fellowship, being there for one another. It's much more than going to church together. It's much more than having a meal together, although those things can be included in that. It's showing up at the right time for the right reasons, right when you're needed. A and just having life together, really being there. And so it's, it's really hard to be there for someone in crisis if you don't know them. If, you have, if they haven't gotten to know you uh, and they don't trust you, then it's really hard to help them when they have a need. This fellowship is something we do day in and day out as we develop deep, loving, abiding relationships one with another. And there's a story in the Bible uh, that really touches me. And it's, it's just an incredible story about faithfulness and loyalty. It begins with an older couple, Elimelech and Naomi. And they flee a famine in Bethlehem, which is five miles south of Jerusalem. And they move all the way over to Moab, which is on the other side of the Dead Sea. So the scripture says this. 
In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, um, Bet is place of bread, Bethlehem, place of bread, uh, in Judah, um, which is the southern part uh, of what we would now know today in Israel. Um, they went to live in the country of Moab, which is to the east. You kind of go by Jericho and you hang uh, a right, you go down and it's over in Moab. He and his wife and two sons, the name of the man was Elimelech and the name of his wife, Naomi. And they went into the country of Moab and they remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, well, he died and she was left with her two sons. And these two sons, they grow up and they, they took Moabite wives. Uh, which was something that wasn't supposed to be done. And the name of the one was Orpah, that's one of the girls, and the name of the other, Ruth. And so these are two Moabite women who marry uh, these sons of the man who has passed. And when they had lived there about 10 years, um, these two sons, they also died. And so now it's Naomi and her two daughter-in-laws. And the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. And so, they, you know, in that day, to be a woman without any male relative, any connection, meant you were powerless. You really had very little choices. Uh, most of them included either begging uh, or prostitution. It was a terrible thing in that day um, not to be able to enter contracts or have business or do any of those things. Uh, if something happened to your husband or to your sons, um, then you were really out of luck. And so, just so you get a, a sense of this, here's Moab over here, um, and then you have the Dead Sea. Um, and if you go up from the Dead Sea, you're going to come up here. There's Jericho. You're going to come back into Jerusalem, and there's Bethlehem. It is um, a good journey. I've, I've done that by bus uh, when we visit the Holy Land. Uh, but it's a really, really long journey by foot. Over here is the Mediterranean Sea. And so uh, you can see, basically, that there's a famine over here. They come over here to Moab, uh, and then basically everybody dies except for the women, and then they have to make their way back to survive. So Moab is east of the Dead Sea. And it's associated, though, with hostility and improper sexuality. Um, it was considered that the women of Moab were not um, really the same as the women of Israel, uh, as the Hebrew women. And so they kind of were looked down upon. So again, uh, back to the book of Ruth, it says this. So she, meaning Naomi, set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah, back to Bethlehem. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, no, no, you go back, each of you, to your mother's house. Right? My husband's gone. My boys are gone. I'm too old to have more kids. Not to mention you wouldn't want to wait till those kids were grown so that you could have a husband. Just go, just start over. Right? Just go back to your family. And she says, may the Lord deal kindly with you as you've dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them which was a sign of love and sending forth, and they wept aloud. They didn't want to leave her. And friends, we have to decide, you and I, if we will be present, if we will show up when it's difficult and dangerous with unknown outcomes. What was going to happen next for Orpah and for Ruth and Naomi, they had decisions to make. Would they stay together or would they go their separate ways? And how would they take care of each other? How would they take care of themselves? So again, back to the book of Ruth, it says this. Then they wept aloud again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, which again was a sign of blessing and dismissal. But Ruth clung to her. And this word clung in the scriptures is as close as someone can be to you, um, woman to woman. So she said, see, this is Naomi here. See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. And your God, my God. Some of the most beautiful words in all the scriptures. Your people, my people, your place, my place. And where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. She is all in, friends. And may the Lord do thus, and so to me, and more so as well, if even death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. Now, you got to think, as a mother-in-law to a daughter-in-law, that's a pretty cold response. It wasn't, she was like, oh, thank you, I was really worried about the trip. It's going to be much better to have a companion to go all the way back to Bethlehem by foot. Thank you so much. Is there any of that? No. You know, want to know why? Because she's a Moabite woman. 
I mean, it's just cold. Ruth is doing the right thing at the right time for the right reasons. And her mother-in-law, who she's trying to bless, is kind of like, okay, you can come. So the two of them, they go off. And they come all the way to Bethlehem. They make all the way, you know, past the Dead Sea, back up from Jericho over to Jerusalem, and back down the five miles to Bethlehem. And here's what we have to know, friends. So often when we think about our faith, we think if we'll do the right thing at the right time for the right reasons, then we'll be blessed. Well, we will, but it may not be like you think. It may not be goodies here in this life, or, you know, you're certainly not going to win the lottery. So here's the thing. Your faithfulness may not be appreciated, but God is always working for your good. See, it's, it's not important what Naomi thought about Ruth's faithfulness. What matters is what God thinks about her faithfulness and about your faithfulness. So, so look what happens as the story continues. They actually get back to Bethlehem, and there's a rich, powerful man by the name of Boaz. Then Boaz said to a servant who was in charge of the reapers, To whom does this young woman belong? Ruth. The servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She is the Moabite. Are you kidding me? She has done exceedingly well. Really loved Naomi like a spouse, not a daughter-in-law. I mean, really blessed her and been there for her in ways that normally only a husband and wife would be, uh, in, the, in the best sense of that. And, and still, the scripture calls her a Moabite. It, it doesn't say, oh, the daughter of Naomi, the one that cared for her, or even the daughter-in-law. It's simply, she is the Moabite who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She doesn't even have a title in the family. But watch what God's doing. Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. God is working on Boaz's heart. He is seeing the beauty of Ruth and what she has done. And how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. You see, friends, in this story, it's, it's going to come to pass that Ruth and Boaz, well, they marry and they have a great life together. And that blessing even goes on to Naomi, where they're all taken care of. And God has been proven faithful through the work and faithfulness of, of Ruth to her mother-in-law. But here's the thing. Before um, you would ever think that I'm just saying, well, you know, just... Just keep at it. Just keep being present. It doesn't matter what happens, even if it's terrible or abusive. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. I want you to look at what Ruth is doing. Her faith and her boldness and her activity. She's, she's not just getting walked on. Eugene Peterson says it like this in his wonderful book, uh, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. And of course, Ruth is living that out. He says it like this. For perseverance is not resignation putting up with things the way they are, staying in the same old rut year after year, or being a doormat for people to wipe their feet on. No, that's not Ruth at all. She is there, she does persevere, but it's not that, you know, just whatever happens, happens. She is active in her salvation. She is active in the blessing of Naomi and caring for her. And we are to be active, we are to be present in what God is doing in all kinds of places in the world. Of course, that's in worship, but it's in lots of other places too. So here at Acts 2, our covenant is to worship each week, even when it becomes difficult to do so. Uh, we used to say, and our covenant actually does still say, we worship each week unless we're sick or out of town. Well, friends, now that we're online, you can continue to worship when you're sick and out of town. We hope you will. We're so glad you're with us today. But here's the thing. Sometimes it is hard to worship. Sometimes we're not feeling well, or sometimes we're in a bad place. And it's important that we show up anyway, one for another. It's important that we show up in person uh, because when you sing, more people sing, the better it gets. Uh, when we read scripture together and we pray for one another, it's just better and better and better. And online, that's true too. It means so much to us when you engage and, and you take out the sermon notes and, and you fill it in from the app. And we hope you're doing that. Um, that's available to you. And, and we hope that you will uh, let Pastor Brandon know that you're here and where you're worshiping from and how we can be praying for you because we now have people worshiping with us all around the world. Your presence makes a difference, friends. Will you say that with me? Your presence makes a difference, both here at 4848 West Covell and online. And so I thank you for, for being here and, and letting us know where you are and what you're doing and, and how you can be praying for others as well as how we can be praying for you. But it's hard to show up sometimes, particularly if we don't think about it, if we're not intentional. Some years ago, two Princeton University psychologists, John Darley and Daniel Batson, decided to conduct a study inspired by the biblical story of the Good Samaritan. 
In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus tells a story of a Jewish traveler who's been beaten and robbed and left for dead by the side of the road, the road from Jericho to Jerusalem. Now, both a priest and a Levite, religious and highly thought of men, they come upon the man, but they don't stop. They pass by on the other side. Apparently, they had things to do. The only one to help was a Samaritan, a member of a hated minority. Yet it was the Samaritan who helped, who cared for him, and paid for a hotel room. It was the Samaritan who did the right thing. Now, the psychologist, they met with a group of seminarians individually and asked each one to prepare a short talk on a given biblical theme, then to walk over to a nearby building to present it. And along the way to the presentation, each student ran into a man slumped in an alley, head down, eyes closed, coughing and groaning. The question was, who would stop and help? Some of the students were given themes on why they had chosen theology, others given the topic of the relevance of ministry today and, and maybe you know, what they think about that, and others the parable of the Good Samaritan. And in the final instructions, one important distinction was made. In some of the cases, as they sent the students on their way, the experimenter would look at his watch and say, oh, you're late. They were expecting you a few minutes ago. We'd better get moving. In the other cases, he would say, hmm, it'll be a few minutes. Yeah, it'll be a few minutes before they're ready for you, but you might as well head over now. And what happened next was nothing short of shocking. Darley and Batson wrote, Indeed, on several occasions, a seminary student going to give a talk on the parable of the Good Samaritan literally stepped over the victim as he hurried on his way. The only thing that really mattered was whether the student was in a rush. Of the group that was in a hurry, only 10%, one out of 10, stopped to help. Of the group who knew they had a few minutes to spare, 63% stopped. Now think about this church. Malcolm Gladwell, in his book, The Tipping Point, How Little Things Can Make a Big Difference, writes these words. What this study is suggesting, in other words, is that the convictions of your heart and the actual contents of your thoughts are less important in the end in guiding your actions than the immediate context of your behavior. Think about that. The words, oh, you're late, had the effect of making someone who was ordinarily compassionate into someone who was indifferent to suffering of turning someone in that particular moment into a different person. Gladwell writes, epidemics are at their root about this very process of transformation. The little things making a big difference. The streets we walk down, the people we encounter, and most likely our schedule, more than our beliefs, shape who we are and how we act. While we know Jesus says, love your neighbor, our schedule says, you don't have time. Maybe next time. And God knows, and you know, you're not really all in. Simply because you're too busy with your own agenda to stop, listen, and respond to God's agenda. So we have to be present, friends. And when we talk about presence, of course we're talking about worship, but it's much more than that. We are present with God and for God. We're present in prayer, we're present in worship, we're present in service, we're present in our community, right? You have to let your light shine, uh, not just for yourself, but for others, and in crisis. But we're not going to be very good in crisis if we're not present before the crisis. And so as Gladwell shows us very clearly, you can't be present in a hurry. You can't love your neighbor in a hurry. It just doesn't work. You can't give a hug in a hurry. Will you say this with me? You can't be present in a hurry. It takes time to show up for those in need. It takes time to even know the need. And that's why I'm so happy and so pleased that we have members of our church like Kathy Wallace, who are not only active in places like Edmund Mobile Meals, but actually lead there. Um, Super involved uh, and leading in our community, being present in the community. It's very important. We also have other folks in our church um, that are on staff at the food bank. Uh, and do great work there. And so here's uh, Nicole Morning with a whole bunch of our youth group. And we don't just do these things here locally. We also uh, go all the way to Guatemala. And we are present there for those in need. This wonderful picture here, um, this wonderful life-giving water, this happens because we're in relationship with people where we know their name, we know their families. We go back year after year after year. And this December, we'll put in our 30th water well. We celebrate that. But you have to show up. 
you have to go to make the difference. It, yeah, it'd be a lot easier just to write a check, but the, what happens is not the same. The result is not the same. This only happens when you show up. So when we show up for people in need, we live into our membership vow of presence. That's what that's about. Uh, yes, it's a worship, and that's important, but it's also about showing up for those in need. It takes time to show up for one another, doesn't it? It sure does. And live into Jesus' new commandment. Jesus is really clear. He says, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. That takes time. Just as I've loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Friends, think about this. Jesus spent three years with 12 people, pouring into their life, blessing them, living with them, moving with them, eating with them. It took a lot of time for Jesus to love those around him. It'll take us some time as well. And sometimes, when we're talking about this, uh, we think, well, yeah, we know the church should show up for us. Um, but here's the thing I want you to know. It's not that the staff shows up for you. We are the church. And, and the staff has a role to play in that, absolutely. And we have an amazing staff here. But if you want a friend, you have to be a friend. Just like Megan said. If you want a friend, you have to be a friend. And if you want people to show up for you, well, you better have showed up for somebody else. Now, you're not going to have the relationship unless you're connected. And that's why this time of year, we are sold out all in to try to help you get in a small group, a Bible study, a place of serving, a place of helping, a way to be connected in some way. It's super important. Because what happens if, is if you don't do that, if you're not connected in some way, when you have a need, probably, unless you're pretty bold, no one's going to know about it. There's just no way to know that. And so the church, to be the church, to be present for one another, it takes us connecting, being intentional and connecting with one another. Now, why is all this so important? Well, because church is not a vending machine of religious goods and services, right? I, I would never give my life to that, right? B3, oh, you get some communion. A4, you, you get a prayer or, or whatever it might be, right? A recommendation letter. I have no interest in that and, and you ought not either. The church is the very hope of the world. So here's the thing. You can't have other people do your loving for you, right? You just can't. It's something that only you can do. And all in people, we change the world for good. And, and so we're called to be all in people and we change the world. And not just change the world, but we change it for good. I came across um, um, some work uh, that, that asked this question and it, it really struck me. It asks, do you know the one thing every kid needs the most? Do you know the one thing that every kid needs the most? Across cultures, across races, ethnicities, uh, across age groups, it, it doesn't matter. It's all the same thing. Do you know the one thing that every kid needs the most? Adults. Adults. And that's true in every phase. Little babies need adults. Toddlers need adults. Children need adults. Youth need adults in their lives. Chris and Ivy uh, says it this way, adults who will show up predictably and consistently over time. In fact, it's the one thing they need more than anything else. We are doing our best work when we simply show up. And I think she's exactly right. Don't fall for that myth of quality time. Our kids just need your time. Just your time. And here's the thing. You never know what God will do with your obedience. You never know what God will do with your obedience. Say that with me. You never know what God will do with your obedience. It will change the world. I want you to think about this. Let me go all the way back to Ruth for a second. In the New Testament, the very first words in the very first book in Matthew are these. Here's an account of the genealogy of Jesus, our Savior, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. This is how it starts. And then it goes on. And Solomon, the father of Boaz, oh, there, there he is, by Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed, by who? Ruth. Now think about this. Boaz only becomes the father of Obed by Ruth's faithfulness to Naomi. For her to be all in, for her to be present wherever Naomi would go. So there's Ruth and Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, oh yeah, He's the father of King David. Ruth is the great grandma of King David. Let that settle in your mind, right? And all of this is so much at stake and, and based on the need for faithfulness and obedience. So here's Ruth 
great-grandma, King David, and Jacob, the father Joseph, the husband of Mary, and of whom Jesus was born, who was called the Messiah. There's a whole lot of folks in between there. I just didn't read them all to you. But ultimately, our Savior comes through the faithfulness of Ruth. It's in his very genealogy. So this week, as we go out into the world, and we are present to the world, I want to invite you to do these things. Last week, we committed to praying five times a day at waking, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and before our head hits the pillow. Thank God for what God's doing in your life uh, and reconnect. Be present with God this week. And then show up for someone outside your family this week. Just show up. Be present for someone. And, and I know it can be hard even to show up for our family, but here's the thing. Our family, really, it's still about us. What if each one of us simply said, okay, God, who would you want me to bless this week? Who would you want me to be present for this week? And then go do it. Just to be a blessing. Just to get to know your neighbor. Just to do the things that God is calling us to do. And then, after you've prayed, and after you're being present, there's a big question that lays before us. Today, decide what is most important to you and commit your time there. Commit your time to that. Like the young woman who had to reassess her life when she looked at that moment of death and she decided, oh, I only have one life to live. And that's true for all of us. She was like, nope, I'm not going to live like that anymore. This is what's most important. And I'm going to put my time, my energy, my resources, my life there because that's a life worth living. And you can do the same. So as you pray, I hope God and his kingdom and being present for others gets to the top of your list because it'll change the world and it'll change your life. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you that you are present with us right now with the power of the Holy Spirit, that you are present in the person of Jesus Christ, that you have come to earth, that you would love us so much that you would leave all of the heavens to come and show us the way, the truth, and the life. We thank you, Father, for all these things. And we thank you for sending Jesus to us who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.